Hi everyone! I want to start this video because it's a little different from what I normally do by explaining why I want to add to this growing dialogue on racial and economic barriers to careers in science. Lack of diversity in science is something that I experience every day I go in for work. Um, for context, I'm a third year graduate student in chemistry at Caltech. I came to Caltech from a small liberal arts women's college, Mills. And while I love the people that I've gotten to know in the classmates and professors that I've worked with on both campuses, something that makes me feel, for a lack of a better word, uncomfortable is the noticeable difference in diversity on the two campuses. As a white cis woman, I'm more acutely aware of economic challenges, but in this two-part video, I would like to tackle both. So the first part is going to be on economic barriers primarily, and then the second part is going to be on racial barriers. I'm going to start the economic barriers discussion by explaining my background a little bit so you can see where I might have limitations in my perspective. Growing up, I felt I was definitely part of the middle class, and I want to address what I mean by that. Being a part of middle class for me meant that I felt generally stable in my home life. My family didn't struggle to pay bills or buy food like some of my friends growing up who made around 50000 a year. My sister and I went to public school, and I didn't participate in any expensive extracurriculars. Despite the security I felt growing up, surprisingly, it occurred to me my first year at Caltech that most people I knew could not have gotten in here. It stuns me that I'm here, actually. The fact is that for an economically disadvantaged young scientist, it is highly unlikely they would ever find themselves here or somewhere like here. And I will further explain this shortly. But it honestly really bothers me when people think everyone at schools like Caltech, at quote-unquote elite institutions, are uh, a bunch of geniuses. My colleagues work very hard, but they're not smarter, in my experience, than the average person that I've met in other places. They work hard and were given a lot of advantages over other budding scientists that they don't often want to admit or can't even notice. I don't have time to get into all the ways in which economic class clearly impacts a student's chances of getting into a place like Caltech, but I will give a few. You might notice in this two-part video that I'm reading off the script more obviously, and this is because this topic really matters a lot to me and I don't want to mess anything up, miss a point by trying to freestyle. So, yeah. The examples that I'll explain include access to tutoring support and having family and friends with post-secondary degrees and PhDs. To start, most of the undergrads and graduate students that I've met at Caltech have had access to tutors and private school educations, even at early grades that most people don't. At their private schools, which were funded for often primarily white neighborhoods, they have access to newer and better equipment. Additionally, because private school teachers are compensated more appropriately and tend to be less overworked, pub uh, private schools tend to have more advanced curriculum within the same grade than public schools. Secondly, students that I've met at Caltech have been surrounded by people who already have higher degrees, often in science as well. It is not uncommon at all for me to talk to people who have two scientist parents with PhDs. Meanwhile, when I was at my undergrad mills, most of my friends were first-generation college students, meaning that they were the first people in their family to get a bachelor's. What this means is that my colleagues at Caltech, for the most part, were raised to get these higher degrees. They had advice and help along the way from experienced and well-connected people. If you aren't that far along in your career in science yet, you may not know how important connections really are. When you are applying for a PhD program, for example, you are being able to say, I worked in so-and-so's lab over the summer can mean the difference between an acceptance and a rejection letter. And a lot of my colleagues were able to access these opportunities through their relatives and family friends connections because scientists hang out with other scientists. Or perhaps they just had a knowledgeable family member who pointed them in the right direction. Meanwhile, first-generation college students don't even know often that you need this experience to get into graduate school, let alone where to look or who to talk to. I'm going to move on now, but I would like to pause and say for those of you watching interested in a career in science that research experience is super important when applying to graduate school. I will try to leave some resources in the description, but also feel free to email me. Up to this point, I've explained from my personal experience the mechanisms which make careers in science more probable for the wealthy. But how significant are these economic barriers? Let's start by looking at a plot presented in a 2015 New York Times publication. The plot displays national data relating parents' income percentile to percentage of children who attended college. The published piece is actually interactive and asks you to draw a guess before showing you the real data, so I am showing off how close my guess was. I guess I'm not really happy about my guess being so close, though, because its cynicism was rightly placed. 
The poorest people in the country are highly unlikely to attend college while the one percenters are basically guaranteed to attend. In short, correlation between wealth and likelihood to attend college is almost perfectly linear. Another New York Times publication from 2017 took a closer look at the economic gap at the most elite colleges in the country and found that at 38 colleges in the United States, more students came from the top 1% than the entire bottom 60%. What is really important about these statistics is that these 38 colleges consist of the most elite institutions in the country. Five of these schools are in the Ivy League. Elite institutions like the Ivy Leagues are noted to, quote, turn out not only well-rounded student athletes, but future presidents, Nobel Prize winners, and other high-achieving graduates. If the wealthiest people in the country make up this disproportionate an amount of elite school attendees, then clearly the system is dysfunctional and overlooking talented but economically disadvantaged students. I want to add that some schools, like my current college of Caltech, may not have more 1%ers than 60%ers, but they still host a disproportionate number of wealthy students. In fact, the New York Times profile on Caltech found that the median household income of students at Caltech are around 150000 a year, with 69% of students coming from the top 20%. And I really love working at Caltech, but the fact is that we are an elitist institution and that if we really value diversity, we do need to work on these numbers. I would like to move on now to racial barriers, but conclude my discussion of economic barriers by saying there are even more studies that evaluate impacts of economic disadvantagement on the potential to have a career in science. For example, instead of looking at wealth versus college attendance, we can study the barriers more directly. In creating this video, I read studies on first-generation college students, public schoolgoers versus private schoolgoers, and the impact of SAT and ACT prep courses on scores. Studies like these help explain the trends we saw on previous slides and offer direct solutions to bridge the economic gaps. While my discussion so far may imply this is only an economic issue, the fact is that race and economics are intrinsically tied in the United States, hopefully as most of us are aware. In short, due to hundreds of years of systematic racism towards people of color, particularly black people, through disenfranchisement, heavier policing, and denied access to housing and employment, there's a huge racial economic divide that is in fact growing. Take for instance this plot displaying the median wealth in the U.S. in 1983 and 2016. The median household income for black and Latino families is less than 10% that of a white household. And the median household income for black families actually decreased between 1983 and 2016. If you would like a more thorough discussion of the racial economic divide, I would recommend watching the video, How Can We Win?, presented by Kimberly Jones. In short, students of color are much more likely to face economic barriers to a career in science than their white counterparts. In addition to this economic racial divide, scientists of color experience a whole other set of racial barriers. These racial barriers, like economic ones, begin in their early education, but unlike economic barriers, which would arguably become less pertinent as one becomes a more established scientist, even the most established scientists of color still face societal and structural racism. I'm going to end this video here, but please tune in for the next video where we address just some of the many racial barriers that scientists of color face.